Well, maybe we'll jump right into it then. Let's do it. Cool. When did you start using laptop um, as a performing and improvising instrument? Yeah, I mean, I started I started doing that in like my first performance laptop as like a performing instrument, not just like not just like pressing space bar on a piece that I had written because I was doing that when I was at Texas between 2002 and 2005. But then uh, in 2005, uh, my good friend Mike Vernuski and I were asked to do music for a play. And um, we, we were asked kind of, you know, late. And it was a very, like, open form play. And so I threw together some software where I could, like, trigger sounds and, like, do processing on his guitar. He was a guitarist. And, um, and that was the first time I did improvising on the laptop, really. I mean, I'd, I'd also done, I had done some, like, laptop ensemble pieces too where that were pretty improvised so so that was the but that was the first time it was like improvising with other instruments and i kind of quickly it was like oh i i like this um because of the the you know the the way you prepare for that kind of uh work is totally different than composition work and um yeah so that was like the beginning and then when i was at columbia um i had been working on like uh, all these software instruments that um, I would basically make for like a piece, right? So I'd make a piece, make a piece of software, and then I'd make, and, and it was it was like improvised. I kind of had this idea, actually I had this piece that was was improvised where like the player would play something and, and the, but, but the software was like linear. It was like, I, okay, I'm gonna do this thing and I'm gonna improvise and then they're, then, okay, now you do this thing and I'm gonna improvise, you do that thing, I'm gonna improvise. I kind of realized at one point that like if I took all that and I just kind of like put it so that I could do them in any order, then I could perform any piece. And that's essentially what improvisation is. And so uh, so that's where I started, um, started uh, making my software, which I probably, the first version of it's about 2009. What kind of software do you use and did you create in order to make this as expressive as you want it to be or as you need it to be in that context. Yeah, I mean, so I, I've, I've been working in Super Collider f since 2002 about. And um, and so basically all my software is written in Super Collider and I have various controllers and stuff that control the software. Um, my system is like super modular, meaning like I have these modules that do things like there's a filter, there's a delay. There's a distortion um, that's not totally right, but you could think of it that way. There's like these little things. And so basically I figured out how to um, take those little modules and then put them together and really um, in ways where I could quickly move between different kind of setups. So it's like, okay, I'm in this setup and I can manipulate the sound this way. And then it's kind of like a little Rubik's cube. And then I'm in this setup and I can move, move improvise it this way and then choo -choo -choo, I can change to something else. So it's all written in super collider. Um, all the codes online. Um, it's not, it's not designed for other people to play. I mean, it's not that they couldn't play it. Um, it's just, they probably couldn't install it. That that's more the problem, but, but the, the code is there for people to take so that they can look at it and steal stuff. I'm totally cool with that. So it's that kind of open source project where people can steal from it. So from the beginning, when you first started doing this to now, how has the software changed or how have you, your yeah. approach to it changed? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it just slowly changes over time. I mean, it, as you guys, as like these really high level practitioners with your instruments, you know, that like there's, um, there, you know, there's like these ramps and these plateaus, like you, you have, there's like this ramp to like you ch you're changing a lot, you're changing a lot, and then you get into a place and you kind of hit a plateau and you're like, um, either can't come up with new ideas or, or you, you, you have some technique that you can't overcome. Um, and then you overcome a technique and, and uh, there's a new ramp to a new, new, a new plateau. And, um, and that, that comes in two different forms, really. It comes in the form of performance of like m me, my, my brain and my ability to uh, do certain things and, and create certain actions. Um, I was showing a piece of software to um, Hans Tushku at Harvard the other day and he, he had a very, it was, I had made this like three minute piece kind of showing the software and he was like, well, it kind of changes regularly. And it was like, well, 
that wasn't the software's fault. That was my fault. You know, that was, that was bad performance, not, um, not bad software, but, um, so learning how to listen and interact with the stuff that I've made. Um, sometimes those plateaus come with something you've made. I've made like, you know, years ago and you find this like I'm sure you'd like, you, you know, with your instruments, you find this like fingering and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I could do this thing. Like this fingering would combine with this armor shirt and all of a sudden there's this thing that happens and like then you start exploring that little tiny thing. Um, I remember a, a gig, I tell this story often, it was uh, me and Ingrid Lobrock and Nate Woolley playing a trio gig and um, and it was in this the back of this bar in Brooklyn and I don't know what, what was going on, but the, the bar clearly didn't want nothing to do with this gig. So they were like, we were out back, like playing for like, you know, seven people. And then there was somebody then out front front of the bar, which was completely empty. Um, they were, which, you know, it was like we were in the performance space. Um, but there was, they were playing like the, that Offspring album from 1992, like at full volume, full volume. And so like, we're trying to play a set and there's like the Offspring playing at full volume, which is like, really one of the most soul crushing things you could have, you could think of. And, um, and Nate, Nate was just had nothing to do with it. He wanted nothing to do with it. And he just played as quietly as possible. Right. So he was just playing like this, like <laughs> being a CC about things. So it was like the offspring with this, like, <sighs> and so like Ingrid and I just had to go with him and, and I found that gig, I found all these like really quiet things I could do that I just didn't know I could do. Um, so that was like a really, I, I figured that's one of those like big ramps to a new plateau that happens in like one day out of some totally weird situation that for some reason you find yourself in. Um, and those, and then they often come from, from like software design stuff, which usually takes a longer time. Um, but it's like, working on the software and all of a sudden there's a problem and you're like, okay, I have this, this problem that I need to address. And, um, and sometimes it's like rewriting the entire, I've rewritten the like core of my software, like the foundation four or five times. Um, and those are things that take like two months to do. Right. Um, sometimes I'll, the thing I've been working on for two, two years are these like, um, these like neural net based instruments that I control with things like, this joystick and uh, my iPad and stuff. And, um, and those things take a long time. So there's like the software stuff that takes a long time. Then there's the playing stuff that takes a long time. And then there's like these like magical things that you can only find in the software you thought you knew by, by playing and being in weird situations that push you in new directions. So speaking of those hardware devices, how do you think about creating a performance practice on them and like do you, how do you select them to control that and and how do you go about practicing with the with those tactile things in order to be expressive on that instrument yeah i mean i part of the thing about like making an instrument is that while you're making it you're playing it so that's like a really um that's a really important aspect of of my my practice as a designer um because because i'm playing i'm making and playing at the same time and kind of like you know if i'm playing on my ipad um some of it has to do with just like layout right like this like this button needs to be here and it's been over here but now i now it needs to be over here and and so you, you you're playing and you realize okay i need to move this thing um and it just takes takes time to do that kind of stuff um but then yeah i, I try to practice a lot. I mean, in the in the COVID times, you know, up until I started working on this this current project with the um, synths, um, I couldn't really play solo. Um, I could, but it wasn't. I didn't really know what to do. And I think now I can. I can actually probably pull off a, a solid solo set. So that's something I've been working on this year, and that takes um, figuring out how to make not only have enough sounds to be able to do it, but then to, to be able to like traverse uh, through various soundscapes in a, in a piece. And um, yeah, I think that just takes doing. I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't really play an acoustic instrument. And part of it is that I think when I sat down, like when I would sit down to practice piano, I'd be like, you know, I've got that Beethoven piece up there and 
I'd start practicing and then I'd just start messing around, you know, and like and before I knew it, I'd be like, you know, playing all over the keys and something was happening, which uh, makes this instrument perfect for me because um, there's no there's no right way to play it. So the best way to play it is to just uh, mess around until you have something uh, good. And yeah, and it I don't have like a rigorous practice routine. Like that's just not something I do. Um, historically, like, I mean, over like a 15 year period, I have had bands and stuff. So um, when I first moved to New York, I had the band Glissando Bin Laden and we practiced every week, you know? Um, we would just get together every week and and practice for two hours and then go have beers. And that was like the best. That was the best. Um, you know, it's hard to get that time now with a set group of people, but it's something I um, I want to do again. So speaking of playing with other people, what's... What's the difference you experience when using the instruments to improvise with just like one other person, whether it's Peter, Dana, Ingrid, whoever, versus mm -hmm. like a fuller ensemble, like wedding? Um, yeah, like how do you prepare for that differently? Totally. I, I don't um, I don't know if I prepare for it differently. I mean, my, my instrument is is like a setup, like like basically like I've made it so that I can do everything I can do all the time. So that's a nice um, that's a nice Thing. So, so really it comes down to playing rather than setup. Um, and, but approaching those kinds of, of, of playing, you have to think about the, um, the, the playing very differently. So if I'm playing a duo, um, it's really like a constant, like, you know, two people constantly oftentimes making as much sound as possible. Um, and that is, uh, that requires a certain certain kind of like not physical stamina, but like mental stamina and musical stamina that you can where you can sustain that kind of um, constant uh, churning of information. So, uh, but I think if you listen to like Peter's and my duo playing over, you know, we have like ten years of duo albums, and um, the first album like is like three two minute two minute three minute pieces and then one eight minute piece that we thought was so long you know um and that's because we just didn't have a um big enough repertoire of stuff we did um and the last time we toured and recorded an album we were playing these like hour-long pieces without really even thinking about it um and that just happened naturally over time like we didn't um it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't something we were thinking about. It just kind of happened. Uh, we were pushing ourselves. Um, and like, who knows, next time we do it, maybe we'll play like two minute pieces and see what happens. Um, but then with a larger ensemble, but I would also say, so playing with somebody, somebody like every, every person, what I think is really cool is like every person in every group, it's almost like when you sit down as a group, I almost feel like you, you, you make a language within like 20 minutes and like within 20 minutes this thing happens that like where everything clicks i mean it's not always true but like where things click and and you go like oh this is this music i make with these people um and oftentimes it's it's like the story with nate and ingrid it's like oftentimes it's like music you haven't made before and it's cool because then you can like translate that into other situations it's something i really like about playing with new people um as much as possible, but then playing in an, a large ensemble is 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 very different. So playing with Wet Ink or playing with like Evan Parker's large group, um, the the it comes down to being more of a role player, being more of a team team player than a um, than a you know a, a soloist, and um, really finding the spots where you play, and then also reducing your spectral content. So that it's not just flooding the um, the uh, stage with you know just burying everyone like that's something you know I can do really easily. Um, although although in louder situations like if I'm playing in a band that's just like five people just blowing their brains out the whole time I actually can't play because if I were to play at the level that would complement them I, everyone would go deaf. Uh, so there's that's a just a, like a, a weird acoustic thing. 
Um, but yeah, it's more, it becomes more about listening and, 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 and not playing than, than playing. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say about that. Uh, I don't remember what it was though. So in that setting, like a large ensemble setting, mm -hmm. are, are there other musicians who are like, you're processing their sound and using it or like, how, is it the whole ensemble or is it just a few people? How does that work? Yeah, I mean it matters, you know, like with Wet Ink, I'll put a mic on everybody and just see what, you know, if we're going to if we're going to do like a free thing, that's how I'll do it. But but then in different pieces, um I might only do processing on like two people. So like I think in my large my piece Lines on Black, I do processing on voice and um saxophone and th that's those are the only instruments I'm processing. So uh every everything else is done differently um so so it changes yeah and and the last time i played with evan's group um he basically said uh sam you're only going to process bass clarinet and bass or something like that and so basically that was that was all i got which was actually a cool limitation right so then that actually informs uh what i'm going to do during the set but but if i can i'll put a mic on everybody and see what see what happens do you find it easier to to limit yourself in, in in some of these settings so that you don't have infinite options when you sit down to perform? Because sometimes I feel like, or, or, you know, it seems to me like with an instrument like that, you can do anything and it's a bit overwhelming sometimes to like select the right thing for the right setting. I mean, there's also like this issue of density, right? Like you can make so much sound all the time. So how do you select you know, yeah. I'm going to just do this one thing or this one sound or. Whatever. I mean, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a free set then I won't, I won't think ahead. Um, I mean the, the software, I know it well enough so that I can like hear what's going on and, and like the software set up. So it's like, I hear what's going on and then I make a change and I go to this space and I, and I can complement the situation. So it's like almost, as much about listening as it is about, um, playing. Um, but then, so last year I did a project with, with Ingrid LeBrock and, um, it's, it was an orchestra. There was, it's a two CD set and like, there's a small ensemble stuff and then, and the, and then an orchestra and there, and it's the same music, but it's like two different versions. And I mean, with an orchestra, like I really had to be totally, you know, I'm, I'm adding like little flavors to the music and that's really my role. I'm totally, and I'm totally cool with that. Um, and in that situation, I definitely, um, I definitely uh, had to hold back, but I also had to plan ahead. So it's like, okay, when we were rehearsing, it's like, okay, during this thing, I'm going to, I'm going to play this synth and I'm going to play it this very specific way. And that's, what's going to happen there. And until I come up with something better, that's what's going to happen every time. Um, yeah and so 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 yeah reducing and and then you know putting into the score what i'm going to do at certain spots i think is is really important especially in in noted music what do you think about creating a vocabulary on the laptop hmm i mean i think that i mean i think just by its nature i mean you say like oh it can do everything but it really can't you know it can only do it's a, it's actually a very limited instrument, especially when you're dealing with processing, because when you're, the cool thing about dealing with processing is that you are, you always get to sound different, right? Depending, so if I'm processing a saxophone or a violin, I get to sound like a different instrument, which is really neat because then I, I don't get sick of my, um, my timbre, uh, as easily, I think as, as all of, all of us can. Um, but, um, Sorry, I lost track of that question. What was, what was the actual question? <laughs> was how do you think about creating a, a an improvisational oh, uh, vocabulary okay. on those? Right. So so then, but then, th then building up like a a big frame of like things I can do. The the the, the network of stuff becomes the vocabulary, right? And and so the vocabulary comes not out of the um the sounds themselves necessarily but it comes out of how i can move between the sounds um and how i can um yeah go between ideas so um so that's something that like i'm always at like, like 
I'm always adding to the instrument and putting new new things into it um, and pushing myself. I, I want to keep pushing myself. I don't want to get stuck in this th in like the same thing. And so I want to push myself to add new stuff. And then I want to be able to access all the stuff I'm using all the time. But something that happens there is that some things fall away. And um, and that's that's important. Like it's important to let some things go because they're just not inter they're, they're not interesting anymore or they're like cumbersome or you know technically cumbersome they're like hard to hard to deal with i gotta like bring this thing with me and it's like a pain to bring on an airplane or you know so 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 i letting ideas go away i think is really um is really uh, important too I, it reminds me of this story i think it had to do with milton babbitt where like babbitt was like yeah um i've got this uh piece i think i'm gonna take it out of my catalog and somebody else was like you know some pieces just get taken out of the catalog on their own <laughs> which is true yeah true with software too some some things you like work really hard on it and then it sucks you got to get rid of it is, is the same true for for the hardware you use in terms of vocabulary or like does that function differently no absolutely so like the you know, for years I used a Snyder Phonics Manta and it's like an amazing instrument uh, that is super expressive. And I based a lot of my my uh, software around it, but turns out I'm allergic to metal and it's made of metal. So I had to stop using it. So I had to take basically take my main instrument and like not use it. And so I've had to come up with uh, solutions for that. Um, you know, I, I've got my got my iPads that that's something like I used to play with one iPad a uh, Manta and a Manta and now I play with two iPads and a joystick and so it's like just slowly changing those things over time I think is really um really helpful in keeping the the thing moving um and and also like looking for other um other stuff all the time I mean in the end what you have with a computer is um, buttons and knobs, right? So that's all you have. That's all you got. So, uh, so really, any kind of like, um, you know, s special kind of controller or whatever is really just buttons and knobs. And uh, and so you have to imagine whether that's important to bring that kind of controller into into the fold. Whether that really changes anything. From a tactile sense, does changing to a joystick, like how did that affect mm. your performing? Because I saw you perform not on a joystick. So I'm having trouble picturing like what, what, so what does that mean to you when like you change to a joystick? I love the joystick. I mean, there's a reason. So, I mean, that's a great design, right? Like it's a great design that was made for games. Um, and it's, it, there's a couple things about it. One is that these things are like super um, like they're, it's not going to fall apart. I mean, I could, I can, but the cool thing is I can just buy another one. Um, so I can, but I can, I can really beat the shit out of it. Right. And because it is designed for a, uh, 12 year old boy to play a flight simulator game or something. Right. So which, um, they're not thinking about like, keep, keep me in good shape. And I've had the uh, same joystick for two years now and I play it almost every day and it's still really in perfect condition. Uh, it'll probably break tomorrow after I said that. Right. Um, but like, but that being said, it's like really physical, which is nice. And the way I, I use it, I don't really think it's not, it's not a, um, it's not a precise instrument, right? It's really about just like being super physical, um, with, with the device. Something else I really love about it is that it is, um, it goes left, right, up, down, but then it also has a third dimension of, of yaw, which, uh, adds a whole, adds a whole thing. Because now you're not, like when you're dealing with two dimensions, anyone who does this stuff for a while, when you're dealing with two dimensions, it just gets a little boring. But if you add that third one, all of a sudden it's like, mm, I don't even know if it, I don't even know where I am anymore, which is actually a really nice place to be with an electronic instrument. What is, can you talk a little bit about specifically what those parameters control in your software? Well, that's the, that's the, um, that's the thing. So I've been using these neural networks, um, and what that allows you to do uh, is they can do they. So ba it's it's totally insane, actually. Like I I didn't even um, 
I mean, the person who got me into it is Ted Moore, and and he was using them for he uses them kind of in a different way. Um, but then I saw I saw the um, instrument uh, the Rebecca Febrink, who's made this thing called the Weckinator, which is this really awesome, um, which kind of brought like neural networks to a lot of this stuff that we're doing. Um, but what that what it allows is those three dimensions, those like. I can basically take you know this left right up down yaw and I can just take those three numbers that are changing all the time and I can send them through a neural network and then out the output is like can be anywhere between like 16 and 80 numbers so the mapping doesn't really it's not a one-to-one -one mapping it's more like um, it's more like it's more like 3 to 80 um, and I basically say like, okay, when the joystick, when the joystick's like this, make this, these 80 parameters. And when it's like this, make those 80 parameters. And when it's like this, make those 80 parameters. And when it's like this, make those 80 parameters. Then I press train and then it magically works. So um, it's a really cool way to, like, I don't, I can't, I don't know. I don't know if I can go back. I was just l reading this article by Leticia Tsunami, who's this uh, instrument designer uh, living in uh, and composer performer living in San Francisco and and she says the same thing she's like yeah now that I do now that I'm doing this why would I go back to that other thing it's ridiculous like a slider like are you kidding me I could control like the volume with a with a slider now I, I can control 80 things with a joystick it's crazy so um, that's where that's where I'm at with that it's really an exciting place to be I'm wondering what are some times like in the past that you've gotten stuck in terms of like the equipment and like maybe the ergonomics of it and you've switched yeah. it up like what are the reasons that you've changed how the setup is yeah so that, that was a big one when i started doing these these neural nets right so when i started doing this uh synthesis became a bigger part of what i do um and i had already put my software into a setup where there were two ipads and both of the ipads actually controlled the same software but they controlled the software in a, um, uh, they, I could, I could basically, there, there was like eight, yeah, it's kind of confusing, but there was, there's each iPad had eight panels and those eight panels did eight different things, but I could be in panel one in one iPad and panel one in the other, and then they would kind of mirror each other, but I could be in panel one in one iPad and pa panel three in the other, and now they're doing different things. But when I added the, the synthesis stuff, I realized I wanted to. I wanted a, an, a, an iPad dedicated to uh, the synthesis stuff. So the joystick and the iPad are basically controlling these these synths, um, and so I had to move everything kind of over to the other iPad. So so I figured out like, oh, I actually don't. I'm using up two iPads worth of space, but I can actually put it all on one iPad. So I figured out a way to do that. To do that takes like a you know a huge amount of coding because I have to change the inner function of the of the entire proj project um, and and rearrange not just the hardware but rearrange the software um, i just did that again with the neural net stuff where i had to move certain functions from like one place to another in inside the software and yeah it, it just takes a lot of um, rebuilding and then actually i was just using it right now and there was something messed up with it so it's still tweaking so that that process tends to be like like there there when i have a hardware or a software issue it te that those tend to be bigger issues that take a little time take a little tweaking take a lot of time to debug even when i think i'm done like you think you're done and no way you've got like months of you know fixing little little details um which I'm sure, like, I'm sure for, like, instrumentalists, that's that's really a, you can relate to that, right? Like, it's like, you know, figuring out how to get this thing and then how to get it so that you can get it every time. It's, those are two different things. I don't know if my saxophone makes 80 sounds that change, though, every time with all these parameters. No, it's not 80 sounds. It's one sound. But, like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like having, like, a... a you know, like a, what it, I think it probably might feel like is like you have a fingering on the saxophone and a certain embouchure and like, just like the tiniest change in like fingering and embouchure and all of a sudden the, psh, like it just like totally changes sound like this, like multiphonic pops out or, or, uh, you know, it kind of does like some kind of weird, like 
vibrato thing. And that's, that's kind of what it's like, because that's actually what's happening when you do that. Like when you do that, the whole tube is like either being split in these weird ways or like it's opening up in a weird way. And you get this, this like sound, this timbre that comes out because of all these things that are, you're like slightly moving around. I think instruments themselves are actually ha have this, right? Like, cause you're, um, you have to deal with like with embouchure, with throat, with fingering, um, with face muscles. And like th th those are your, those are your 80 dimensions, right? They're all they're all up here. I, I, I get keys. It. so yeah. it's like it's like a way to control timbre on your instrument as opposed to like sound content necessarily or like different ideas. Totally. Yeah, and, and to switch between different ideas, I I just press a button, right? Like because the neat thing about the joystick is it has all these buttons too. Um so yeah, so it's more like moving around a timbre space. Um, okay, so I'm curious to ask you about this band that you were just talking about, Glissando Bin Laden. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, or, or, you know, Wet Ink Ensemble, but maybe I, I, I would guess that everybody that's in Wet Ink is in a different position in their life than when you were playing in Glissando Bin Laden. Yeah. Um, but can you talk us through what an improv rehearsal might look like for you if you were all to get together and say, now we have two hours, what are you going to do during those two hours and how would you um, approach that? Yeah, I mean, we would work on different pieces and we would work on those pieces in different ways. So that was a band where we like really had pieces, which I, I, I haven't done that that in, a, in an improv band since really, but but we would have, and so we might start like, okay, we're gonna play Hebe Hauling. We're just gonna play it, see what happens. Um, then we might, uh, so we'll spend a little time doing that, talk about it, see what, you know, um, see if there's like anything we wanna ch tweak with it. Then we might, maybe we're working on a piece, we're like writing a piece. Um, and so that might be, what, what would happen in that band, so there were two of us making software, it was me and Alex Ness. And, um, and, and so we would maybe in a rehearsal come across a, a technical thing that we wanted to do. So at the time my software wasn't so developed. In fact, it wasn't developed. Like I was writing new pieces of software for each, um, each uh piece and so so like for instance one piece we did it's called bees in space it's a good piece check it out um and carrie was like hey i want to do a ring mod in this piece right so ring mod is is super easy to do technically but like to be able to do it with like multiple different uh inputs is actually you know that's challenging so okay so I might go away for a week and like get that ring mod going, like get it into the software so that I have some control over it. Uh, and then the next week we try it out. So then, so then we would try out the thing and then, and then see like what kind of music would come out. So this was a really interactive co group that composed pieces together. Um, so we would, you know, try things out until we, we found like a narrow um, space where like that was the, that what we thought was like the piece. So that might be a, like a little bit of rehearsal. Um, then we might do a, like a free a free thing and, and, and mess around. Um, yeah, so, the, so it was kind of broken up that way. Probably have a, a beer. Um, and I think the nice thing about really one of the, other than, you know, being in a band with four of my other best friends um, was like there were, very distinct musical personalities in that group. So I was like, I'm very noisy. Like everything's kind of noisy nonsense. And then um, Gem Altieri is very uh, drony. Like <laughs> she loves to drone like on these like microtonal drones. Um, and then Caroline Maloney is much more melodic. Um, uh, and uh, And so, those kinds of personalities kind of like on these totally opposite ends of the musical spectrum kind of going together and um, making a, a, a new thing was really cool. I have, this is maybe unrelated, so I'm gonna take us away from that for a moment, but. That's fine, yeah. Um, have you ever had lessons with anyone? Uh, what do you mean? 
I don't know, like musical lessons or like, is that, have you ever gotten feedback in any way from like a mentor type figure? I know that there hasn't necessarily been anyone to do what you do. Uh, or maybe you didn't find anyone when you were younger, but I'm just curious, like, has that been something you've wanted or done in the past? Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure, like in the, in the realm of electronic music, just because it's like, it's this huge topic, but there's, it's not, I haven't had lessons on, with like a performer, if that's what you mean. But like, you know, I went to UT Austin and I said with Russell Pinkston, Russell kind of taught me how to do electronic music. Um, he taught me all the techniques of electronic music. Um, and so that, I, I would say, yeah, those were my lessons. And then when I went to um, uh, Birmingham in the UK, I studied with Scott Wilson and he taught me more stuff. And then I went to Columbia and studied with Brad Garton and Douglas Rapetto and George Lewis and they taught me other stuff. So um, not like pers not like directly related to like playing. So it's not like a techniques lesson, but like more like com more like composition lessons, but as electronic music lessons. Um, I think I've, pro I've probably definitely given more lessons on it than I have <laughs> taken for sure. Uh, and that's a that's kind of a neat thing going forward is that now there's people that do this and it's, you know, and and, you know, you can ask them stuff. <laughs> so when you give lessons, yeah, I mean, I was talking from a performer standpoint, so I should have specified that because obviously yeah. you're taking composition lessons. But um, sure. when you give lessons to laptop performers per se, like how much of it is spent like getting to know their software and the equipment they're using? Because obviously it would be a little bit different than what you're using. And then giving them, a, you know, advice or feedback based on that. Yeah, I mean, it is hard because because people use such different things. So, like, I've had you know somebody who's using like who's making like pop jazz using Ableton, right? Or then I have somebody else who's like, um, you know, doing their own code in Super Collider, and then I'll have somebody else who's like, uh, I don't know, doing something else. So, so it is it is uh, a it's it's a I think it's a less focused, um, probably pedagogical model, which is actually fine. Um, sometimes I'll be sol helping them solve technical issues. Sometimes I'll just like help them think about bigger structural issues. Um, I don't think it's all that different from a composition lesson, honestly, because it's more like, it's more about, I mean, there are technical things where you're like, okay, this doesn't work. Like, what can you do? Um, and it's maybe more asking more questions than, um, than anything else. Um, I've given some lessons to like performers. I had like a really really early on in her career, like I met with Charmaine Lee and like I, I had her perform yet. She comes into the lesson. She's like, oh yeah, and we, we played this duo and it was like, we got done. I was like, why are you, why are you taking a lesson with me? You're insane. Like you're so good. But in that, in that situation, I actually said something I think was useful. I was like, well, you know, you're using this microphone, like, but you should use it, like get it in your face, get it away from your face, like really move it around and find all these sounds. Next time I played with her, it was like, you know, she took that to a whole level that I just didn't, you know, couldn't have seen. So I think there's like little things that you can say. And I think that's true with composition lessons, true, too. Um, I don't know, it makes me, reminds me of somebody who was percussionist who was studying at Manhattan School of Music and they were getting, uh, going into percussion lessons every week and their teacher would be like, you got to play on the tips. You got to play on the tips. <laughs> and like, he, he just was like, it's like the teacher said it enough where like, it, it was too long. Like he couldn't, he couldn't ask what that meant. You know, like, like it was like a couple months in and he's like, I really don't know what he's talking about. We'll play on the tips. And so then like four years later, four, it started four years of this person never could ask. And then finally, like one day he was like, Oh my God, I know what it means to play on the tips. So I think there's like teaching is such a weird thing. And it's like, you can you can give big ideas. You can say really dumb things. You can you can accidentally say something really hurtful when you were trying to be helpful. Um, but I think when it comes down to this kind of stuff, it's like big ideas that help somebody do what they were going to do anyway is way more interesting and helpful than like really trying to tell someone what to do. So in terms of your composition and performing specifically improvising like how do those two things feed into each other oh it's constant 
yeah, it's like this like constant back and forth um, game dialogue about um, sounds and ideas about form. Um, I just like, like something playing like a large improvised group with like, I don't know, a big group of like, of like Evans and Parker's, right? You, you uh, realize that this like compositional idea of like bringing back ideas is complete nonsense. It's like complete, I mean, it's not that it's bad. It's just like th that being some like, some like overarching idea about like how music has to work. No, that's how music had to work uh, in the classical period when they were like trying to make rhetorical, um, uh, you know, statements about uh, like how the world worked. Well, that's not that we don't live in that world. We live in this like world of insanity um, where like you're referencing all these things and there's all these ideas flying around. It's like, oh, you're saying that? Like, I'm going to do this. You're doing that? I'm going to do this. Bring things back can help, but but not it, it does it, sh it can't shouldn't necessarily be the focus of, of composition for me. And so what that's allowed me to do is, is free myself up as a composer and really think about those experiences of playing in those groups when the music was best and like what what is what is actually happening formally and structurally that um, that makes things meaningful musically. Um, so I think I think the, it does tend to go from the improv into the composition more. But I also I, I do think that as since I've studied composition, like. I will do things in a in a large ensemble improvisation or even a small one that 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 will kind of will kind of reference to the past or and will kind of co or co completely contrast the past or like create like a large slow gesture that like just like totally takes away something that happened earlier um, and I think that that comes from the composition too um, sonically in my compositions that's where all a lot of my musical ideas are coming from is from the improv is like hearing these sounds and like playing this like weird instrument like I think my acoustic music sounds like electronic music no matter what like I can't really and that's just because this is my instrument this is what I do um, being in Paris it's like I, I, I still haven't been to the church where, where Messian played but it's like Messian sounds like an organ all the time it doesn't matter whether there's an organ in the piece or not right and it's because he played the organ um, I'm really hoping there's going to be some organ concerts because I think that's something they could do here, like a Sunday afternoon organ concert. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think the di that's a, this endless dialogue going back and forth, um, endless until I stop doing one of these things. <laughs> and oh, to add one more thing to that is that, and, and now it's like I can't really even imagine just like, I can write a composition that's all the notes on the page. And I, I know there's reasons why I would do that, but I don't feel the need to do that. Like, I feel like if if I have Josh Modney in the ensemble, well, he's gonna make something up that's way better than what I was gonna write. So like, why not, why not do that? Um, and then write something else for him to play along with. And that, that could be really interesting. So. Um, Allowing those two worlds to kind of be simultaneous is also something I'm really uh, fascinated by. So thinking about studying um, or teaching improvisation, composition, non-musically, so like not composition, not practicing your instrument, what do you think would be helpful for a student to study um, that's not musical, that would feed into this? Oh, to study some other form? Well, I've gotten, so in my dissertation, I talk about this, but I've gotten so most of my ideas from, from um, books, you know, fiction, like not nonfiction, but fiction, because um, composers, I mean, writers are dealing with form and color and idea and like, and, just like ways of manipulating um, manipulating um, ideas that are really complex, 
really complex like shapes, uh, temporal shapes in a, in a book that I think composers and improvisers can learn a lot from uh, because 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 the, the formal structures aren't as um, codified into this thing that we're taught this like ideas about like classical form that we're taught um, and yet there is form so that's a, I think something to, to look at for form is is recent books um, and and those have given me like the thing in my dissertation is about David Foster Wallace and it's all about it's all about like the, the the end note thing the idea of like I'm reading here and then there's a number and I have to go to the back of the book and then look at that thing okay cool and then I've been back here and then and it's this idea of jumping back and forth between like multiple temporal universes that I'm interested in but um, uh, I've had a lot of uh, a lot of influence like Ocean Vuong had one recently and I can't remember the exact thing but it was like I was reading I was like oh my god that's like the greatest formal idea I've like ever read and it's just just a simple twist of um of, of ideas another thing is um is uh comedy i think comedians are masters of form because form uh comedy is all about timing and music is all about timing there's a in the Chappelle block party he actually says that he's basically talking about Thelonious Monk and he says like musicians and comedians are the best friends because our best friends because it's all about timing and uh, and I totally think that's true. I also think that improvising comedians are some of the most brilliant people in the world. And uh, if you want to listen to two great interviews, I, I haven't listened to this one in a while, but there's a um, the podcast, uh, You Made It Weird by Pete Holmes. Um, a couple years ago, he did one with uh, Reggie Watts, who's a musician, comedian, improviser. I mean, it's just like, it's so insane. Uh, what what he can do, um, and if you watch a couple different sets of his like comedy, it's it's like the way he's dealing with like set forms of ideas, but then they're rotating around each other in new ways every time he does it. Um, and then Kiko Michael Key, who's from um, Key and Peel. That's his name, right? Did I get that right? I feel like I, I feel like I did. Um, and um, it was just like so many so many words there. Uh, the, the, the way they talk about the way they talk about improvisation, it's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. Um, and they're better at talking about it because they're people who deal with words all the time. And as musicians, we don't deal with words all the time. We deal with sounds. We're like, beep, bop, boop, boop, boop. Right. That's, that's how I try to explain something when I want to, but th these people are really good at dealing with words. So, um, so I think that's something else to, to listen to. Um, I think, uh, Good films too, like like action movies. You know, let's get some, let's get more action mo movies into this. We need more like dumb explosions. Like, what's your favorite dumb explosion movie? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is Independence Day. What's yours? Oh yeah, <laughs> great one. It's a great, it's a great. Uh, geez, I don't know. I, I, it's not my favorite because I haven't seen it forever. But the second uh, Lord of the Rings movie is the only movie I've ever seen three times in the theater. I mean, that was a long time ago, but like, that was like 20 years ago. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, but I saw it three times because like every time I watched, I just couldn't believe, I couldn't believe what was going on. It was like, I, how are they doing that? How are all those, all those like monsters attacking that castle? How'd they do it? How many extras? And like my favorite thing about watching that movie is you watch it. And then at the end, it starts listing the credits and they just keep going, you know? And they just keep going. And then it's like people for this scene. And it's like, it's like 4,000 people in a scene. It's like the entire population of New Zealand was in that scene. Um, so that's, I haven't seen it in a while. It's probably terrible, but I, I really liked those movies when they first came out. <laughs> so how did the pandemic affect your work and what are you doing now? Oh, I'm... Um, <laughs> how did it affect my work it, it made it all of it not exist I mean like <laughs> when you, I mean I just I don't know the one thing is the one oh, here's the silver lining because is that like actually somebody asked this on Facebook the other day it's like what's the silver lining they were like none and uh, my answer is well taxes were a lot easier you know 
There's like nothing to put on. I had no 1099s. There was nothing there. Uh, <laughs> so just, which is not good. Um, I think find, figuring out how to play solo because I've had to, because that's all I've been able to do, you know? And so like forcing myself to kind of practice as a solo musician, which I think is going to seep into the work when I'm playing with other people. So, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a plus. Um, I haven't written much music. I've mostly been working on software to the point where like, I am worried that I might only do that for the rest of my life. And it's not a worry. It's more just like, that might be all I do, um, from now on. Um, and, and I've gotten really into, yeah, I've gotten really into programming languages and like math and Fourier transforms and, um, and like weird, like complicated synth synthesis algorithms that, that I, I couldn't do before because I didn't have the control and now I have the ability to control them. Um, so that's really exciting actually. Um, yeah, I, I, just a broader like uh, thought on it, but like, I think the, the, um, I wonder if music is going to be a little different for a while. And, um, because I think we're going to make it for different re different reasons. Like I, Oh yeah, this was something else I did. So my Alex Ness and I, who was in the band we were talking about, Glissando Bin Laden, um, he and I worked on a time stretching algorithm. And so um, if you go, uh, it, so there's this famous algorithm called the Paul stretch and it basically does, the, you, you can take anything and stretch it like a hundred, a thousand times. Um, basically we took that algorithm and then we like made it way better. And so that's something we did. And we, we worked on that for like six months together. So I think those kinds of projects have been something I've been doing and something I'm, I'm interested in. Um, I find, I find, yeah, software and that kind of stuff to be really interesting right now. I mean, you know, part of it is I'm like in my house alone all day and it's like, well, Normally I'd be running around and have a million things to do. So it's kind of focused my brain on these things that I can, I can do and, and enjoy doing uh, alone. But I really, I really, as I'm sure anyone you ask that question, like I just really miss making music with people and it's really bumming me out. Like actually, so a couple weeks ago, these guys in Cologne asked me to do something where they have this really, it's a trio and the main guy's a trombonist and, but they have this really cool like playbacks, like speaker system uh, made of um, tr trombone, like it's like speakers playing into these like trombones that they like put around the space. Um, and it looks cool and it sounds really cool. Um, so they're like, hey, can you, can you make a 15 minute track to, for us to improvise with because they can kind of do stuff this summer, but they like, I couldn't go play because that was the original plan. And I was so excited. And even just like the thought of this music being played with somebody else, I, like I wrote it in like three days. I just sat down, <laughs> like whipped out this like 15 minute piece. And, and it really felt like I was playing with another person. And so th that's, um, so that's a weird project, but I like really enjoyed it. Um, and it's kind of a, a thing, you know, to do in the future is like, I'm also going to do that with Dana, Jessen and Eric Wubbles. We're going to do this like trio gig at Oberlin, but none of us are in the same country, Never mind uh, the same, same city. So we're going to have to like do it that way. And although it's not ideal, I think there's, there's at least something to it. I think we're missing it as well. <laughs> Very much. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for chatting with us today. Yeah, this is great. Really nice to see you, you too. Thanks for your time, Sam.